Chapter 10 of Waifs and Strays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Waifs and Strays by O. Henry. Chapter 10 The Dog and the Playlet. Usually, it is a cold day in July when you can stroll up Broadway in that month and get a story out of the drama. I found one a few breathless, parboiling days ago, and it seems to decide a serious question in art. There was not a soul left in the city except Hollis and me, and two or three million sun-worshippers who remained at desks and counters. The elect had fled to seashore, lake, and mountain, and had already begun to draw for additional funds. Every evening Hollis and I prowled about the deserted town, searching for coolness in empty cafes dining rooms and roof gardens we knew to the tenth part of a revolution the speed of every electric fan in gotham and we followed the swiftest as they varied hollis's fiancee miss loris sherman had been in the adirondacks at lower saranac lake for a month in another week he would join her party there in the meantime he cursed the city cheerfully and optimistically and sought my society because i suffered him to show me her photograph during the black coffee every time we dined together. My revenge was to read to him my one-act play. It was one insufferable evening when the overplus of the day's heat was being hurled quiveringly back to the heavens by every surcharged brick and stone and inch of iron in the panting town. But with the cunning of the two-legged beasts, we had found an oasis where the hoofs of Apollo's steed had not been allowed to strike. Our seats were on an ocean of cool, polished oak. The white linen of fifty deserted tables flapped like seagulls in the artificial breeze. A mile away, a waiter lingered for a heliographic signal. We might have roared songs there, or fought a duel without molestation. Out came Miss Loris's photo with the coffee, and I once more praised the elegant poise of the neck, the extremely low-coiled mass of heavy hair, and the eyes that followed one, like those in an oil painting. She's the greatest ever, said Hollis, with enthusiasm. Good as great northern preferred, and a disposition built like a watch. One week more and I'll be happy Johnny on the spot. Old Tom Tolliver, my best college chum, went up there two weeks ago. He writes me that Loris doesn't talk about anything but me. Oh, I guess Rip Van Winkle didn't have all the good luck. Yes, yes, said I, hurriedly, pulling out my typewritten play. She's no doubt a charming girl. Now... Here's that little curtain raiser you promised to listen to. Ever been tried on the stage? asked Hollis. Not exactly, I answered. I read half of it the other day to a fellow whose brother knows Robert Edison, but he had to catch a train before I finished. Go on, said Hollis, sliding back in his chair like a good fellow. I'm no stage carpenter, but I'll tell you what I think of it from a first-row balcony standpoint. I'm a theater bug during the season, and I can size up a fake play almost as quick as the gallery can. Flag the waiter once more, and then go ahead as hard as you like with it. I'll be the dog. I read my little play lovingly, and, I fear, not without some elocution. There was one scene in it that I believed in greatly. The comedy swiftly rises into thrilling and unexpectedly developed drama. Captain Marchmont suddenly becomes cognizant that his wife is an unscrupulous adventuress, who has deceived him from the day of their first meeting. The rapid and mortal duel between them from that moment, she with her magnificent lies and siren charm, winding about him like a serpent, trying to recover her lost ground, he with his man's agony and scorn and lost faith, trying to tear her from his heart. That scene I always thought was a crackerjack. When Captain Marchmont discovers her duplicity by reading on a blotter in a mirror the impression of a note that she has written to the Count, he raises his hand to heaven and exclaims, O oh God, who created woman while Adam slept, and gave her to him for a companion, take back thy gift, and return instead the sleep, though it last forever. Rot, said Hollis, rudely, when I had given those lines with proper emphasis. I beg your pardon, I said, as sweetly as I could. Come now, went on Hollis, don't be an idiot. You know very well that nobody spouts any stuff like that these days. That sketch went along all right until you rang in the skyrockets, 
Cut out that right arm exercise and the Adam and Eve stunt, and make your captain talk as you or I or Bill Jones would. I'll admit, said I, earnestly, for my theory was being touched upon, that on all ordinary occasions all of us use commonplace language to convey our thoughts. You will remember that up to the moment when the captain makes his terrible discovery, all the characters on the stage talk pretty much as they would in real life. But I believe that I am right in allowing him lines suitable to the strong and tragic situation into which he falls. Tragic, my eye, said my friend irreverently. In Shakespeare's day he might have sputtered out some high cockalorum nonsense of that sort, because in those days they ordered ham and eggs in blank verse and discharged the cook with an epic, but not for Beeway in the summer of 1905. It is my opinion, said I, that great human emotions shake up our vocabulary and leave the words best suited to express them on top. A sudden violent grief or loss or disappointment will bring expressions out of an ordinary man as strong and solemn and dramatic as those used in fiction or on the stage to portray those emotions. That's where you fellows are wrong, said Hollis. Plain everyday talk is what goes. Your captain would very likely have kicked the cat, lit a cigar, stirred up a highball, and telephoned for a lawyer, instead of getting off those Robert Mantell pyrotechnics. Possibly a little later, I continued, but just at the time, just as the blow is delivered, if something scriptural or theatrical and deep-tongued isn't wrung from a man in spite of his modern and practical way of speaking, then I'm wrong. Of course, said Hollis, kindly, you've got to whoop her up some degrees for the stage. The audience expects it. When the villain kidnaps little Effie, you have to make her mother claw some chunks out of the atmosphere and scream, Me child! Me child! What she would actually do would be to call up the police by phone, ring for some strong tea, and get the little darling's photo out ready for the reporters. When you get your villain in a corner, a stage corner, it's all right for him to clap his hand to his forehead and hiss, All is lost! Off the stage, he would remark, This is a conspiracy against me. I refer you to my lawyers. I get no consolation, said I, gloomily, from your concession of an accentuated stage treatment. In my play I fondly hoped that I was following life. If people in real life meet great crises in a commonplace way, they should do the same on the stage. And then we drifted, like two trout, out of our cool pool in the great hotel, and began to nibble languidly at the gay flies in the swift current of Broadway. And our question of dramatic art was unsettled. We nibbled at the flies, and avoided the hooks, as wise trout do. But soon the weariness of Manhattan in summer overcame us. Nine stories up, facing the south, was Hollis's apartment, and we soon stepped into an elevator bound for that cooler haven. I was familiar in those quarters, and quickly my play was forgotten, and I stood at a sideboard mixing things, with cracked ice and glasses all about me. A breeze from the bay came in the windows, not altogether blighted by the asphalt furnace over which it had passed. Hollis, whistling softly, turned over a late-arrived letter or two on his table, and drew around the coolest wicker armchairs. I was just measuring the vermouth carefully when I heard a sound. Some man's voice groaned hoarsely, False! Oh, God! False! And love is a lie and friendship but the byword of devils! I looked around quickly. Hollis lay across the table with his head down upon his outstretched arms, and then he looked up at me and laughed into his ordinary manner. I knew him. He was poking fun at me about my theory, and it did seem so unnatural, those swelling words during our quiet gossip, that I half began to believe I had been mistaken, that my theory was wrong. Hollis raised himself slowly from the table. You were right about that theatrical business, old man, he said quietly as he tossed a note to me. I read it. Loris had run away with Tom Tolliver. End of chapter 10 Recorded by Adam Carroll, Boston, Massachusetts, November 2012